Always good to see everybody. Join me, please, as we confess our common faith. I am a child of God. I am saved by grace. I live each day by faith. And I'm ready to hear God's word. Boy, it's great to have you with us. Please stand as we honor God in the reading of his word. Fairly short reading from 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel 11. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was. wonder what he had in mind. And he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period, and then she returned home, and later when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, surprise, surprise. I'm pregnant. Boy, this is going to be a passage we want to look at seriously. May God bless this reading, as people said. It's good to see everybody this morning. Let's just go to work and jump right into this lesson. I I entitled this lesson, Wrong Time, Wrong Place, Wrong Action. Sometimes it happens, doesn't it? Sometimes it happens. We find ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time, and that puts tremendous pressure on us to do the wrong thing. It makes it tough. One thing I like about the Bible, when the Bible tells the stories of its characters, it doesn't dress them up, put bows on them. You have great men of faith like Abraham, who lie about his wife. You have great men like Jacob, who deceive his friends and his brother. And you have great men like David who get involved in things they're not supposed to be involved in. In fact, in Scripture, one of the common themes is that good people sometimes do bad things. Now, that doesn't give us a pass. I've heard people say, well, even Bible characters sin. That doesn't mean, you know, you got a free pass, go out and have a good time. What it does do is it reminds us that none of us are more than a a bad decision away from ending up in the wrong place. And the problem with sin is it's so insidious. It's always around us, and it tends, once you open the door to it, it tends to entangle you. It's a lot easier to get into sin than it is to get yourself out of it whole lot easier. And that's something that I think in theory we know, but do we really think about it as we live our daily lives and make decisions? That's why God warns us to be constantly watchful. This is a common theme. And the word watchful in the Bible is a military term used to describe the guy who's on sentry post on the, on the walls of the city at night a city that is surrounded by the enemy, a city that is under threat of invasion. And they post men on the walls and they say, be watchful. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. Pay attention. Survey the territory. Know what's going on. I had a good friend who who served in Vietnam. He was in a patrol of about six guys, and what they would do is they would fly them into North Vietnamese enemy territory, and they would drop them about six or eight miles behind enemy lines. And their job was to do one of two things. They were either supposed to find a certain target and assassinate that target, and then figure out how to get out with all of the angry bees swarming around them. 
or their job was to simply survey and reconnoiter the area and come back with a report on where the troops were, what they were doing, how many there were, what kind of equipment they had. The idea in both cases was they were in hostile territory. They couldn't even trust the local people because sometimes they were as much a part of the enemy as, as, as the enemy was. They had one guy he used to tell me about, Jim would tell me about, little little Puerto Rican guy from Brooklyn. He says he was the lifesaver of our group because this kid was street smart beyond words. He had grown up on the grimiest, grittiest, most, most hazardous streets of New York City. And he had a sense of smarts and survivability about him that was unbelievable. So guess what? When they went on patrol, he was the point man. His job was to be the first guy out there. And if, the, you know, any of you that know what I'm talking about, if, if they were walking along and all of a sudden he went like that, everybody froze. Because when he went like that, that means that in his super sensitive survivability mode, he'd seen or heard something that didn't look right. Now, that's a guy you want to be watchful, right? You don't want him to wander out on a pathway with about 45 Viet Cong walking down the pathway. Well, that's the image the Bible gives us. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. You know what's interesting about that statement is that statement is not addressed to the average everyday, you know, Sam and Sue who are out there, you know, struggling with it every day and barely keeping their head above water. That passage is addressed to people like us who come to church every Sunday. Read the Bible all the time, say our prayers regular, go out and visit the sick, bring food on collection days. That's who Paul's talking to. He says, be careful. And if, if those of us who are standing need to be very careful, what about those of us who are struggling? Well, that even multiplies it several times over, doesn't it? Let me tell you a story. We're going to do it in, in terms of three principles that, that come out of this story with David and Bathsheba. Number one, good times can often be our times of greatest temptation. Did you know that? Now, that seems counterintuitive, but it's true. People say, oh, no, when things are hard, that's when you lose your faith. No, usually with people of faith, when you hit hard times, you dig in. You suck it up. You get tough. You hang on because you realize that hard times, well, God called you to deal with those. We know we're supposed to be good in those. We know we're at danger when things are hard, when the mortgage isn't paid, when the, the, the loved one walks out, when the kids disappoint us, when we have problems with somebody at work. We know those are tough times. We know God is allowing us to be tested. We know the Bible tells us about that, can it great joy, when you meet times of trial knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and patience produces steadfastness, and steadfastness makes you faithful. And we get that, don't we? We hear that all the time. We don't hear much about the dangers of things going well. But sometimes the time of greatest temptation is when life is going really well. You know why? Because you get lazy. If the guy on sentry duty hasn't seen anything for 30 days, he starts figuring nothing's going to happen. And so he sits down and takes a nap. And that's the night the enemy attacks. Because I'm going to tell you something about the enemy. He doesn't attack when you expect him to. He doesn't attack when you're standing on the wall staring at him with binoculars. He attacks when you're looking the other way. He attacks when you're taking a nap. And we do that spiritually. When things are going well, we get lazy. Well, I don't have to go to church every time. I mean, you know, hey, I'm strong in the faith. I can, you know, set your pattern. Watch what happens. Let me show you in our story. 
By this time in his life, David's been on the throne about 20 years. He's probably in his 40s. So he's a mature, successful man in his middle age of life. He thinks he's, you know, well, he knows he's been as successful as you can be. Would you agree? I mean, things are, things are going well. He's powerful. He's successful. He owns the kingdom. He sits on the throne. He's conquered nations. He leads a great army. He's a man of great wealth. He's a man of great social status. He is, he, he's at the top of his game. We would have to say that at this point in David's life, it don't get any better. He's like the athlete in the prime of his career that just, just signed a six-year, $135 million contract. Where do you go from there? And on top of that, he signed it right after his team won the championship. And he was voted most valuable player. And he just signed a contract with Nike to sell shoes. Tell me it gets better than that. But what happens when that sort of thing takes place in life? You know, one of the things a coach tells his team is don't read your own press clippings. These two teams that are playing for the national championship tomorrow night, they're, they're there every year. This is the, the fourth or fifth year in a row these two teams have played each other, either in the top game or going to the top game. These are two of the elite programs in the country. They'll have recruiting class number one and number two every year. They've got coach number one, coach number two every year. They've got quarterback number one and number two every year. They'll be in the finals every year. I know we get tired of that, but hey, if you don't like it, get better than them. They're good. The biggest thing a coach has to fight against in a situation like that is what? You know, complacency. Hey, we're the champions. Yeah, you're one game shy of not being the champions. You're the champions until somebody beats you and everybody's out there to beat you. And that happens to us spiritually. We get the feeling like we're the champions. We got it made. We're sitting on the throne. We're ruling the kingdom. We just signed a big contract. We just got the big promotion. We, we're where we need to be. Everybody needs to look at me. I'm the example of what God can do in a person's life. And if you're there, God bless you. I'm glad you're there. Be really careful. David was successful. He was powerful. Everything going his way. But David had gotten careless with a couple of things. And this is what happens. You get careless. You don't guard the guys closely. You don't prepare quite as carefully. You don't stay focused. You know, you're, you're more interested in doing an interview than you are about looking over the game plan. And the next thing you know, you get done in. I want to show you an example of this. David, one of the things that God had warned the children of Israel against in Deuteronomy 17, when God, God told them, he says, someday you'll have a king. There are three things you need to tell the king to stay away from. Idolatry, women, and money. Doesn't that sound familiar? Substitute idolatry for anything that displaces God at the top of your list. Okay? That's idolatry. He, he warned the king. Moses warned the king 200 years before they chose a king, 300 years before they chose a king, when you get a king, tell him to watch out for three things, worshiping idols, chasing women, and amassing money. Why? Because all three will corrupt you in their own way. And by the way, these are three things that you engage in when? When you're on the top of your game. When things are going well. When you're successful and powerful, what do you think about? I'm more important than God. Everybody wants to be with me. And I want more than anybody else has. And all of it's available to you. I want you to look at this from chapter 5 of 2 Samuel. 
After moving from Hebron to Jerusalem, Jerusalem becomes David's new capital. David married more concubines and wives, and they had more sons and daughters. Did you catch that? David wants to be like all of the Near Eastern rulers around him, and they all have huge harems of women, most of them taken in as, as uh, guarantees on treaties. If I make a treaty with your king, then he gives me one of his daughters, I give him one of my daughters, and that seals the deal. He's not going to attack a king who's the daddy-in-law of his own daughter. And so that was the way treaties were sealed. Well, here's what happens. When you marry all these women, and by the way, when you marry a princess, you get her entourage with her. That includes four or five or six girls, and they become what are called concubines, which means extra women. And by the way, by the rules of the game back then, they are as available to you as the wife is. They're simply throw-in extras. And he has children with them. I want you to think about all these girls coming from foreign lands. What's the first thing they're going to bring with them? Their religion. So here comes the idolatry. And to keep the little woman happy, if she wants a, an idol of Baal set up in her, in her boudoir, what are you going to do? Hey, if mama's happy, everybody's happy, right? So mama gets a, a Baal idol in the boudoir. If she wants an Asherah on the dining room table, she gets an Asherah on the dining room table. So now you've got all this idolatry coming in, all this false value, all this non-godly stuff coming in. You've got all these kids running around. They're going to be fighting and warring, and this torments David the rest of his life when they start infighting over who gets to rule. And you, besides that, you see... When you feed a sexual appetite, what does it do? It intensifies it. You come in with the idea, well, you know, if I'll just take care of this need, it'll go away. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. That's true of anything. Just a little piece of chocolate is all I need and I'll be fine. That don't happen. Now, you all know that. You can sit and laugh because you're feeling guilty, aren't you? That little, that little piece of chocolate turns into a half a chocolate pie. And then you go to bed and you lay there and instead of visions of sugar plums dancing in your head, you've got chocolate pies dancing in your head. You get up in the morning and you say, well, just a little sliver for breakfast won't hurt. And the next thing you know, you're a chocolate pie junkie again. You're back on that train, huh? Add anything you want on that list. You can change that chocolate pie to anything you want to put on there, and it's true. Hey, listen, all of us, and I had a good friend tell me this years ago, and I appreciate it. We're all addicts to something. Everybody's addicted to something. That's just the way we are. It's our personality as human beings. It's part of the old man of sin that rages within us every day against the self-discipline that God wants us to practice. So David had compromised. Not only that, David began to neglect his responsibilities. Hey, when things are going well, you can hire somebody to take. You don't have to worry about doing your job. I want you to notice the way this story begins in chapter 11. In the spring of the year, now notice the criticism that's built into this statement. When kings go out to war, David sent Joab. Is Joab the king? It didn't say David joined Joab or David led Joab. It said David sent him. And Joab did a good job. That's what generals do. But the last thing it says, however, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. He has no business being in Jerusalem during this time of the year. Has no business being there at all. If he's going to go to war, he should go himself. Kings, leaders lead. But he's fat, he's sassy, he's lazy. Sorry, the knee just went again. Ah, oh, that hurts. I'll tell you about it sometime. We may need a healing service before the day's over. Kings have to act like kings. But he's rich. 
He's wealthy. He's got power. He's got authority. He has people to do everything for him. So, you know, let's just shirk our responsibility. Let's not do our job. Let's stay home. Let's sit back. Let's lean back in the lounge chair, get a big cup of wine, have four or five of your girls sitting around visiting with you, maybe some entertainment. That dirty works for normal kings, not for really successful people like me. Well, that leads to our second point, which is what happens as a result of this laziness. When tempted, the first thing Satan does is blind you to reality. Well, this is not like the average person. I know this, it, this looks like it's wrong, but... In my situation, it's different. No, it isn't. In your mind, it's different, but in your situation's not different. Adultery is adultery. Drunkenness is drunkenness. Dishonesty is dishonesty. Well, but you don't know my situation. I don't have to know your situation. If it's sinful, it's sinful. Knowing your situation is just your way and my way of saying, but I've excused myself on this so that I can go ahead and do it. I can go ahead and indulge my passions. I can go ahead and indulge my desires. I can go ahead and, and deal dishonestly with others because I have given myself permission. By the way, you never commit a sin you don't give yourself permission to do first. The only person who can give you permission to sin is you. Nobody else. I mean, you can ask somebody else. We do that, don't we? Well, Terry, don't you think that'd be all right? Terry says, well, I understand. Well, see, Terry said it was all right. Yeah, but I'm the one that gave me permission. Very important thing to remember. Bathsheba, by the way, there's sin on both sides here. Bathsheba forgot the rules about modesty. I want you to picture the city of Jerusalem is built on hills. There are tiers or levels. And she would be living in the main city down on the lowest level, two-story house. Usually they use their roofs for they might have a bathing area or other things like that. But where is the king? He's up on the highest hill. His house overlooks. It's like having a hill on the, or house on the Hollywood Hills where you can sit on your balcony and, and look over all of the city, including the housetops of all your neighbors, right? You with me? See, you can do that. So why would she be out buck naked on her roof in the middle of the afternoon? Well, she must have forgot, <laughs> right? I'm sure that's what it was. He didn't need to be looking. She didn't need to be showing. Wrong on both counts. Notice, late one afternoon. Afternoon. I can understand if maybe she'd slipped out after dark and thought, you know, because back then they didn't have street lights, and so at least you'd go out in, at, after dark and maybe bathe on the roof and nobody would notice. But right in the middle of the day, after his midday rest, David got up out of his bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Now, the Bible is very honest about its characters. If it says that she was of unusual beauty, that means she was a knock-you-out-of-your-socks good-looking woman. It's exactly what the sense of that word is. When it says she's of unusual beauty, that means she'd knock you off your feet. And here she is on the roof, taking a bath, middle of the daylight, and the king, you, you don't think she knows the king could be up there looking at her? She don't need to be on the roof, and he don't need to be on the balcony. Where's he supposed to be? He's supposed to be in the king's tent on the battlefield. So number two, David forgot something too. He forgot to flee from temptation. Hey, just because he saw doesn't mean he has to pursue, right? 
we all hear and see things that are tempting sometimes, but there's times when you just say no and walk away. I used to hear that as a kid. My parents would tell me, they'd say, you just have to say no and walk away. And I always thought, that's the stupidest advice I ever heard in my life. How dumb can people be? And now at my age, I more than understand what they mean. Because I can look back over my life as you can look back over your lives, and I can, I can mark the milestones of the times when I walked away and the times when I didn't and the consequences in either case. What does the Bible say? James says, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Oh, but it wasn't the devil. It was Bathsheba. Oh, it was the devil. He just dressed up as a woman, didn't wear any clothes. That's, that's the way he works sometimes. Hey, whatever your weak spot is, that's what he's going to probe. Doesn't matter what it is. If your weak spot is acceptance by other people, he'll wear you out with that. He'll give you a whole circle of friends that say, well, if you don't do what I do and you don't think the way I think and you don't practice what I practice, then there's something wrong with you. And there may not be a thing wrong with you. You may be a good, decent, godly, moral person. They may be the one that's all messed up, but boy, Satan will wear you out with that. And then they'll get that friend to find some other friends and here they come. And somebody says, that's right, you preach to those teenagers. No, I'm preaching to the adults, to the grown-ups. Because we're as compromising sometimes as our kids are, maybe more so. Sometimes I think they learn it from us. So you got to think about it. Notice this. This is a very straightforward statement. Doesn't take rocket scientists to figure this one out. Stay away from every kind of evil how many kinds every kind that means nothing gets a pass if if you know it's wrong leave it alone walk away you know when you're in a minefield all you got to do is step on one mine i mean you don't have to like hopscotch from one to the next see how many you can set off before it blows your legs off all you got to do is step on one you're dead or or maimed for life Stay away from every kind of evil. David forgot that. He had to know when he saw that woman on the roof, listen, I just need to go back in and order another, another cup of sweet tea or something. You know, I need to, need to go read a good scroll or <laughs> have a prayer time with God. The other thing is David chose to ignore the warnings that God sent. You know, a lot of times when something is wrong and it's right in front of us, God will send us angels of mercy. He'll send us warnings that something's wrong. Let me show you a great example of that. See, this is where you learn things by reading carefully what the Bible says. David sent someone out to find out who she was. Okay, that's stupid. You already know what's in his mind. It says he's on the roof. She's in the bathtub. He's looking at her. She's knockout beautiful, and he sends somebody to find out who she is. He wasn't wanting to put, him on, put her on his Christmas card list, okay? That wasn't the goal. I want to make sure all of our good citizens get a Christmas card from me every year. He has one thing in mind. That shouldn't be in his mind. But instead of walking away from it, he sent somebody, and he was told this is Bathsheba. And I want you to notice the next statement. The daughter of Eliam, notice what the servant says to him. See, the servant that he sent knows what's on his mind too. Don't be mistaken for a minute. What does the servant say? It's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and she's married. Now, why would he tell the king that? Because he's warning the king, isn't he? You don't need to go there, buddy. Hey, I love you, my lordship, my grand, wonderful kingship, sir. But in my own subtle way, I want to remind you, this woman's married. She belongs to another man. She is not available to you or anyone else. And then you have the rest of the story. Well, he sent messengers to get her. They bring her back. First thing he does, take her to bed. 
Now that tells me something too. She knew why she was being sent for. Agreed? Sure she did. This is a messy situation. And then, of course, you get those two wonderful words, I'm pregnant. Mm. Yeah, those are fun, aren't they? The last thing I want to suggest to you out of the story is sin demands repentance, not a cover-up. At this point in time, when she walks in or sends a note that says, hey, sweetheart, that was great, and I enjoyed that night together, but I'm pregnant. Okay, if you're going to straighten this mess up, now's the time to straighten it up. How do you straighten it up? Well, all you can do is confess your sin, be open about it, ask forgiveness, and move on. Oh, but what are people going to think? At this point, that's a foregone conclusion. But what does David do? He keeps digging. He's 12 feet down and 8 feet wide in a hole in the ground, and he grabs that shovel and just starts digging. Well, if I dig hard enough, I'll get out. No, you don't. You get deeper. Every inch you dig down, you get an inch deeper in the ground. And this is what happens, and we all know how this works. Have you ever tried to lie to get yourself out of something? I know most of you have lived pure, sinless lives, but have you ever lied to try to get out of something? And you end up hanging in a tree in the yard from your thumbs because you got busted. I got to the point in school where I could look in a kid's eyes and tell you if he's lying to me. With some of the kids, you know them well enough, you know they're lying to you anyway because that's what they always do. And it's hard to explain to a kid, hey, once you lie to me, I don't trust you from then on. Anytime you say I didn't do it from then on, I know you did it. Why? Because you lied to me, dude. Have any of you teenagers had your parents tell you that? Amen. You're not going to raise your hand because you're embarrassed, but it's true, isn't it? You lie to me once, I'll never trust you again. I mean, I got kids in their 40s. I still don't trust them. Do not trust them. They lie to me. You know, aren't we funny as human beings? And we think that somehow we can smooth it over. Have you ever tried to patch a hole in a ceiling? You ever tried to patch a hole in a ceiling on a house? How many of you have ever done that? Tried to patch a, ceil a hole in a ceiling. How did it work for you? It looks like a ceiling with a patch on a hole, don't it? You walk in and you look at the ceiling and the first thing you think is, boy, they patched a hole over there. When you sin, it's like driving a nail into a board. You can take the nail out, but it leaves a hole. And the more nails you put in, the more holes you leave. And the more holes you leave, the weaker the wood becomes. It's an insidious process. David needed to, needed to come clean. Sooner or later, you know, even the average knucklehead can notice that this woman who lives down the street is getting bigger in the tummy and her husband hasn't been home in six months from the war and, uh, you know, uh, you don't even have to add two and two to figure that one out. Just show up. Cover-up's not going to get it done. And the same is true in the sin in our lives. We need to repent of it and turn our back on it and not keep trying to rationalize it and justify it, work around it and say, well, my situation's different. No, you're a sinner in the eyes of God. And you need to get it right. Put it down, walk away from it, move on. David tried to deceive Bathsheba's husband. Yeah, he tried to fool her husband. I mean, hubby comes home after four months at war, and mama looks like she swallowed a, a, a watermelon. And, you know, he didn't have to be a really smart guy to figure out that that one ain't his. Doesn't take a genius. So you gotta, you got to do a preemptive strike, right? you got to take care of this problem 
as quickly as possible. So what does David do? He does the same thing we all do when we find ourselves in an untenable situation. Instead of coming straight and cleaning it up and moving on, and then you don't have to worry about it. You, don't have, you tell lies about it, and then you got to remember all the lies you told and who you told them to. Let's see, I told you this lie, and you that lie, and you another lie. Now I can't keep up with all that stuff. It's hard enough to keep up with the truth. Besides all the lies we tell, But David tries to solve the problem. David sent word to Joab. Joab's the commanding general. He says, send Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah arrived, David asked him, I love it. David says, so Uriah, buddy, how's it going out there? I just thought I'd get you in for a little report. Okay, Uriah is not the, the military messenger of Joab. He's not the, he's not the courier that... that Sends messages back and forth. So David tries to be casual. Hey, Uriah, buddy. Hey, how's it going? Hey, have, have a cup of wine. Hey, sit down. Let's talk a little bit. How's it going out there on the battlefield? Boy, I bet it's rough out there. First of all, that's a little hypocritical. Where's David supposed to be? If he was doing his job, he'd know how it was out there. So he's pumping this guy. He doesn't care what's going on out there. If he was, he'd be out there. He's just kind of greasing the skids a little bit isn't he man i tell you boy it sounds like you've had a tough time out there uriah you know man i i just i appreciate i appreciate the sacrifices you've made for your king don't don't have any mistake about it here take this bottle of wine and go on home and spend a night with a little woman you got you deserve a little time off you and you and little mama get together and enjoy yourselves and and it's on me it's on me. I just want you to know how much I appreciate my men on the line. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Of course, what's the plan? Well, I don't have to tell you. Most of us have enough imagination to know he's hoping they go home, have a nice romantic evening, and then he can send him back to battle and everything's taken care of, right? Nine months later, they can all send Uriah a notice of congratulations for his new son. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he'd left the palace, but Uriah, what a knucklehead! He didn't go home. What a warning from God! What a prick on the conscience! What does he do? He goes to the entrance of the palace and lays down by the door of the palace with his sword in his hand and sleeps at David's front door. Why? What's his job? Protect the king. What king? The hypocritical, adulterous king that's gotten my wife pregnant. He's laying there by David's door. He won't leave David's door. He's going to protect him. So that doesn't work. So now what are we going to do? Don't you hate loyalty? Don't you hate somebody that takes his job so seriously that he does the right thing? Now you've got to really deal with him. Well, I've only got one other option. Got to get rid of him. If all else fails, use the mafia approach. Give the guy a double tap on the battlefield. And this is easy to do. In ancient warfare, it's the easiest thing to do in the world. It's kind of like on the modern day warfare, in modern day battlefield. The easiest thing to do is to put a guy in a tank and put him out in the battlefield and wait until somebody pops him with a missile. That'll take care of that real fast. Get rid of him, no problem. Back in those days, there were, there were different groups of men that you sent to do battle. Even during the American Civil War, this was true. The guys that were in the front row of the battle when the charge took place, they knew they were fodder. You read story after story of soldiers climbing over the bodies of their dead comrades to get to the next level. And usually when you assaulted an area, it would take two or three waves of dead before they got far enough ahead to actually hit the front lines. Everybody knew how that worked. Especially when you're attacking a city. What do they do in the city? They drop big boulders on your head. Now, you don't have to shoot a guy with an arrow through the heart when you can drop 
a 60-pound boulder 45 feet down and hit him in the top of the head with it. Takes care of the problem. You've got archers up there. You got I mean, these cities are defended the way they are for a reason. So, the next morning, going to go to plan B. David wrote a letter. Can you believe the hypocrisy of this? He writes a letter to Joab and gives it to your right. Listen, I've got some military correspondence here. You need to get this right back to Joab. What does the letter say? Put this guy in the front lines and make sure he gets killed. So the man who is blindly loyal to David is given a note for David, David, from David to take back to his commanding officer, basically carrying his death sentence. I mean, this story gets sorted. Nasty. The last thing David does then is he seeks to, and isn't this what we always do once you realize how deep in you are? By the way, who killed Uriah? No, he was killed by an archer on the wall. I can show you the passage where it says when they attacked the wall, as he turned to retreat, the guy shot him in the back with an arrow. Hey, it happens. It happens. Especially when you're intentionally putting the front line anyway to make sure it happens. I want you to look at what happens. After Uriah is killed, Joab sends a messenger back to David. And he tells the messenger, just before this passage we're going to look at, he tells the messenger, listen, if he gets mad at you, you just tell him in so many words, I did what you told me to do. So don't get in my grill about it. I'm not sure that's exactly the language he used, but it was something like that. Look at what it says. The messenger went to Jerusalem, gave a complete report to David. The enemy came out against us in the open fields. As we chased them back to the city gate, the archers on the wall shot arrows at them, and some of the king's men were killed. Notice, including Uriah the Hittite. This guy has become the center of conversation in the military circles. Look what David says. Well, tell Joab not to be discouraged. The sword devours this one day and that one tomorrow. Fight harder the next time and conquer the city. Can you believe how callous this man is? He says, well, you know, get one today, one tomorrow. As if the death of Uriah was just some freak random accident. You know, well, it happens. I mean, accidents happen. People die. When this whole thing was calculated and plotted from beginning to end to guarantee the outcome. So now David's solved the problem, right? Nobody knows. He could take, he could take Bathsheba into his house and say that she was beautiful. But now she's single because the Bible says when her husband dies, she's free to remarry. And so he could take her as one of his wives. And, and then they could tell everybody, man, I can't believe it. On our wedding night, she got pregnant. Can you believe that? That is amazing. God has really blessed us to give us a child so quickly. I mean, this is just a nice, smooth story. It's all cleaned up. Boy, that hole in the ceiling's all patched up. By the way, did you ask yourself where the leak was that caused the hole in the first place? Oh, yeah, you forgot about that. Well, guess what? David goes on with his life like everything's fine, but the water on the roof is still leaking into the attic. Drip, 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 drip. And there's one person who knows the whole story. God. God's not going to tolerate it. God will not tolerate it. That's why our lesson next week is entitled Confrontation. Oh, David thinks he solved the problem. All David has done is just put layer upon layer of lies and deceit on top of it. And God's going to strip all that out and strip him down to nothing and say, guess what? You're just a cheap, tacky sinner like everybody else. You're not a royal sinner. You're just, you're a royal sinner, all right, but not in that sense of the word. 
Your money doesn't matter. Your wealth doesn't matter. Your power doesn't matter. Your influence doesn't matter. You are a sinner in the eyes of God. And I'm going to tell you something, old son. God will forgive your sins if you repent, but you're still going to have to bear the consequences of your sin. God says, I'll pull out the nails, but I can't remove the holes. Walk carefully, my friends. When it seems you're at your best, you're at your most vulnerable. Satan will steal your reality, tell you it's different in your case, and then what do you do? You panic, and you start making dumb decisions, and the hole gets deeper. It's a very sobering story. It's a story we've heard all of our lives. Hollywood loves to tell this story. They make it sound like, well, I'll tell you, the way Hollywood presents this story tells you a lot about the people who wrote the script, doesn't it? Yeah. Sounds like they've got some issues too. But there is a lot of sobering thought in this story. I'll tell you, folks, we're all trying to get to heaven. We're trying to do the right thing. We've got to walk carefully. You've got to always think about what's going on in your life and why. I leave that thought with you because it's something I have thought about and I hope you have thought about too. Nobody, nobody in the kingdom of God is bulletproof. Nobody. Now, if you're not a Christian, you're in a really vulnerable place. What if the Lord comes tonight? 1 Thessalonians 1 says, God, Jesus is coming at the end of time to bring the judgment of God against those who know not God and obey not the gospel of Christ. Well, I wouldn't want to be on that team. If you're not a Christian, let me encourage you. The first important decision you need to make with regard to sin and temptation is to become a Christian. Have your sins of your past washed away and cleansed by the hand of God? Baptized into Christ, washed of sins, raised to walk a new life. If you're a Christian, keep your eyes open. Walk carefully. Know what's out there. There's more of them than there are of us. In fact, Satan, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5 that Satan is a roaring lion. And he says you've got to be watchful because he's out there. He's always looking to get a piece of you. And once he gets a hold of you, He'll shake you until you die. Something to think about. Amen? Yeah, something to think about. Listen, we have a, lo- a song of encouragement. If you do need encouragement or if you need uh, to respond to Christ and become a Christian, let's do it right here and right now while we stand.